throw this in front of you. This is a quarterback rating sheet, and this ties into the red zone, and that's why I wanted to present it to you. This is a quarterback rating sheet that, um, let's say that you're into grading your quarterback, or you're grading your players, or you're asking your assistant coach to grade his position. This is a uh, just a chart that I've always used. The result was always given a plus or a minus, very simple, very clean. Did the quarterback complete the ball, or did he not complete the ball? If it were a pure drop, then you can you can you can kind of uh, you know um, skew your grading chart a little bit accordingly. But if it were a completion plus, if it were an incompletion, minus. <coughs> technique. What was his drop back footwork <coughs> like? What was his handoff mechanics like? Did he finish the fake? Plus or minus? But then the reason why I wanted to show you this is now anytime he entered the red zone, he had a red zone grade. And what that does to your to, to your player is it makes emphasis, it places emphasis on that particular phase of the game. And the red zone, in my opinion, is probably as important of any phase that we have as the game evolves. So he, he not only had a result grade and a technique grade, but once he got into the scoring zone or the red zone, then he would get a plus or minus in that particular grade call. And that just brought more emphasis to, to how <coughs> this, this column was and, and, and how the game unfolds. The comments, in my opinion, were the best. If you don't write comments down and verbalize your thoughts, as to what your player could do better to improve his, his performance or what he did well and you're reinforcing it. Boy, the players <coughs> relate to written comments far more than they do plus and minus. Plus and minus becomes sometimes so subjective uh, that it, you, you get hung up on that. And that's why I'm not a real big fan of percentage grades. But boy, when it comes to comments written by my coach, I'm gonna read exactly what he's writing down as I played this game, okay, and this is what a this is just what a grading sheet looks like that I use. Uh, you guys probably have your own favorite forms, and that's great. Just make sure that you have a column for comments, and I think I think you'll be ahead of the game that way. That concludes the uh, scoring zone presentation, and uh, with that in mind, if there are no questions, I'm going to keep moving. Come on in, guys. Uh, don't. don't be bashful coming in. Okay, now let's talk about, and I know you've had a couple of really neat coaches already talk about quarterback techniques and fundamentals, and uh, Coach Davis is here, and, and uh, he, he's as good as it gets when it comes to coaching the quarterback. But I want to I want to share with you some some just some kind of off the top of my, my my memory bank thoughts on the quarterback position. As I told you earlier, I may never coach another down. I may choose to go do something else, maybe start a quarterback academy, whatever I choose to do. So I'm not going to sit here and worry about offering information. Sometimes coaches are very close to the best, and rightfully so, because they, they, uh, they have games to compete, and they never know who's in the audience. But right now, let's go for it, huh? Let's talk about something that, uh, let's say, let, let's, let's change the environment now. You are now sitting in a quarterback meeting room. You are now a quarterback for just for discussion purposes. You are one of three or four quarterbacks in a meeting room right now, and you are on an NFL football team. All right? So you will sit in one meeting after another to where it almost becomes too much. You know, that, that's why uh, sometimes the NFL is totally overrated, you know, when it comes to too much information. However, let's talk about some things that I I really liked as I as I as I went through my, my experience at that level. So here you are, you're one of three or four quarterbacks, you're trying to compete for a job. You are maybe the starter, maybe you're not. But you're one you're one of the four that are in that room right now and you're trying to piece together the best season you can piece together because this is your livelihood. And that's the kind of attitude that you need to take back and share with your young quarterbacks at the level that you go. Not that they're competing for their livelihood, but that's the attitude that they might want to have to obviously understand in order for them to play at a very high level for you. And I bet you a lot of your wins are a product of the fact that your quarterback plays pretty efficiently. 
But let's talk about uh, setting a goal. And uh, this is something that I learned just working with Cam Cameron, as I mentioned to you. A very, very fine football coach who came under a lot of scrutiny with the season that we had, as did his entire coaching staff. But other than that, he, he had some really good ideas to, and he has coached the quarterback position as well. But what he asked of the offense this past year was for each play in that meeting room, as you sit right now, to come up with a personal goal or two that you would s establish for yourself for the 2007 season. And it didn't matter whether it was just one goal, two goals, three were probably too much. We tried to counsel our players as to don't, don't become too unrealistic. Just, just see what you can do. And the theme behind that was in order to achieve a goal, quarterback, you have to set a goal. And so with that in mind, I'll give you the exact goal that Trent Green set this year. And when he did this, we asked each player to basically put down their personal goals for 2007. It could be one, two, three, if he got too, you know, if he got ambitious enough. But again, as I mentioned, we tried to we tried to keep the, the quarterback or the player focused, and we did this with every position. Trent Green put down simply 431. That's all he put down on his personal goals. 431. And I'm showing you this just because of the way one player may set a goal compared to another player. And don't be, become judgmental as a coach because you say, oh man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. No, you just have to understand that each player will have a different approach to how they perceive a personal goal. And 431 for Trent Green, translation meant 4,000 yards passing, three to one TD to interception ratio. And that's what 431 meant for Trent Green. Now, it didn't happen this year for Trent. He got cut short because of the, another injury to his head, and consequently his, his goals were not met. Now, going back to maybe some of his Kansas City Chiefs years, he certainly was a 4,000 yard passer. But this year, it wasn't meant to be. But that's the kind of goal that Trent sent. And he was the start. Okay. Now, here's the backup. Uh, and his name was, and, and by the way, we had each player sign their name to their <coughs> goal. And the only one who saw this goal was his position coach and the head coach. So they knew that uh, it was pretty confidential. Here's another goal set. This was Cleo Lennon, a young man that uh, ended up playing a lot of football for us as a quarterback. And his goal, sorry about that. Is there any way of dimming the lights around here? Trojan fans, this is not in relationship to SC. 
This is just another buzzword that I mentioned to you earlier that I love to use. And an SC drill is simply a, a, an abbreviation for snap count. Okay, snap count drill. And so every, and you may find this hard to believe, every practice at the Miami Dolphins or whether it's at the Kansas City Chiefs, wherever you might want to look at, starts out with this. And you say, God, Coach, that's, that's football 101. That's, uh, that's eighth grade stuff. No, it isn't. When you have a theme in your approach as a coach, and ball security is a big part of that, and we're not going to turn the ball over, where do you think every play begins and ends, pretty much, um, unless it's, yeah, if it's not executed properly, it ends right there at the quarterback center exchange. So we will hit that field at, say, 2.15 or whatever the starting time is, and the first thing that happens on that football field is when the quarterbacks and centers come together and they line up, and if you have three centers and three quarterbacks, away you go. And we do some crazy ass things in that drill. We, we, have, a, we have a period where they start and they, they, they try to take the snap with one hand. And until you ask your quarterback to do that, uh, you just swear there's no way that they ever do that. Well, they learn. Pretty soon, they're learning how to cradle that, that ball on that hand and they can absorb that snap, and, then, and that puts a lot of accountability on the center to be very accurate. That's one thing that we do during this drill. We, we ask the, the uh, quarterback to execute, obviously, the, the snap count. If you're emphasizing a certain snap count that week, we ask them to execute footwork. We don't allow the center to snap the ball and die. We require the center to take three <coughs> steps or beyond on every snap. And I would say, on an average, we probably get 25 snaps. 25 snaps in that period of time. Another thing we do, and we're all in the shotgun. And I you know, there are probably some coaches in here that maybe go 100% shot. And, and if that's the case, then you practice the shotgun in all the different forms that you, that you need to practice. And you make sure you just don't practice snaps. You practice every time you snap the ball, you practice a play. It's kind of like the Bill Walsh axiom don't practice plays during practice, you practice situations, okay? But in this particular drill, we will practice the shotgun as well, but in our particular offense, we'd be underneath center. Second down, we'd be underneath center. And on third down, whoop, we're in the shotgun. And so that's the way we practiced it in this drill. So we didn't just say, okay, let's take five shotgun snaps in a row, because if you're uh, under the center team and you go to shotgun, uh, you know, intermittently, then, then that's the way you've got to practice it. And that's the way we have approached it. So just that's just a little coaching point. And you can, you know, you can install that or, or just leave it alone. Well, then you can pick up that thing and you can throw it in the big end of the page about hurting it. Are we talking shotgun or? Right. Or, right. Under, under, under center? Under center. Under the low, yeah, low. Okay. This is what we've always taught, and we continue to teach this this last year. We always go joint to joint with our palm. And we always, uh, it was never wrist to wrist, or palm to palm, or it was never just, uh, you know, put the pressure with your two thumbs underneath the center. So the center would always feel the, uh, the middle finger and the index finger in his crack. And that's, that's basically the way we coached it. That's where the pressure came from. And that was the only hand that, that was just used as the platform. The left hand was used as the collapsing, and that would always collapse to the ball. So that's why that one-handed drill was obviously what it was, is that, hey, quarterback, remember Jim Abbott, the one-armed pitcher in the major leagues? Well, before he was a pitcher, he took his high school football team in Indiana to the state championship and won them. And he was the quarterback. And he took every snap with one hand. So that's that's kind of the, the story behind this one-handed business that uh, we, we incorporate during this quarterback center exchange opportunity. But we don't do that, we don't do that more than we have to. I mean we want to get to where, hey quarterback, here's the way you're taking the ball, and this is what we want to practice as much as possible. Now, something I learned with Coach Romeo, as I mentioned to you earlier, I, I've been very honored to, to coach under a couple really neat coaches in our business. He taught me 
to always stand as a quarterback coach to the left of the center quarterback exchange, whether it was during this drill or whether it was during the team period. And as a quarterback coach, you're looking right in to that exchange angle. Now you can see whether your quarterback is guilty of what separating with his left hand too early. And that happens sometimes with, with quarterbacks is that left hand will separate and now the ball will be slapped into the into the cavity that is created by the separation of the left hand. So from a left position, that's where I would always find myself standing to coach to make sure the snap was not an issue. And our goal, as it was in the you know at the Dolphins as well as the Chiefs, was our goal going into the season was we were going to be 100 percent at the quarterback center change. That's that should be your goal. You should never give in to a quarterback center snap fumble and and not come down hard on them. And it can be done. It can be done. Um, and it just it just puts a tremendous amount of responsibility on on that exchange. So that's the way that we would coach it. Okay. And when the left hand separates, you've got problems. Here's what I believe. Now I've had offensive line coaches dispute this. But when the ball, you oftentimes say, God, whose fault was that? You know? And try to stay away from that. It, it, it's, it's a batter. It's like uh, a catcher and a pitcher. So when the ball hits the ground, it's both players held accountable. So don't get into that, oh, it was his fault this time. Oh, no, it was that his quarterback's fault this time. But anyway, when, when, you're, when you're coaching it, you, you get the uh, quarterback under center. And if the ball drops directly to the ground and there's a fumble that occurs during practice, I normally chalk that up as a center of issue because the ball came up short. And the quarterback never probably had a chance to uh, absorb the ball. And sometimes the ball, you've all seen it, right? Where the ball just goes doom, right down to the ground. That's normally a short exchange by the center. When the ball filters up through the hand of the quarterback and it kind of pops up through the arm or pops up sideways, sometimes, and I have to regulate my, my thought on this, is I think that's a quarterback problem. I think that's a quarterback issue when that happens. And I, you know, I've been proven wrong a couple of times where the center just got crazy with the ball. But you can kind of, in your mind as a coach, you can kind of, kind of define this. And that's what, you know, you can go on with it. The most important thing is to coach positively and make sure they understand how important this is. Okay, that's the SC drill or the quarterback center exchange drill. Now, during the course of practice, if there is a fumble between quarterback center, we have what we call blackjack time. Blackjack is 21 snaps after practice between the quarterback and the center. And during training camp or during your two days, as, as we call them, we would always have the coach go over after practice and work that drill so that they knew how important it was. But once the season got started and we had a blackjack situation where the ball hit the ground, then it was that quarterback and that center, it was their responsibility to go out after practice on their own and get 21 snaps. And every time you take a snap, you call a play. So that's, that's important. And you start, you start to filter in this period where your quarterback starts to call the play. You don't sit there on the script and call out the play every time. Pretty soon your quarterback's calling out. I write 80 talks, all right? Or <coughs> you're right, 20 travel. And let your quarterback start taking some ownership. Let him start using his mind and his voice in a simple drill like this. Then we move to the quarterback quick step drill. Um, it's a drill. And I, guys, I, I don't have any material, I don't have the equipment to show you, but uh, let me let me see. Uh, you all have seen those platforms, bags, where they're, they're, they sit to the ground, and they're about 10 inches off the ground, and they're flat, and it's a bag, okay? It's a bag. You start your quarterback, if he's right-handed, he starts on the right side of the bag, and he leads across the bag with his left foot. And then he crosses back over to get to the to the original side of the bag. So he leads, crosses over, leads, crosses over. Guess what, guys? This is the way he crosses over, right? When he goes back to drop, five step, three step, seven step, shotgun, whatever. 
if he's a left-handed quarterback and he's striding front and out to his left and he starts on the other side of the bag, on the left side of the bag, he leads and crosses over. And this is a, what we call the quarterback quick step. Kind of a deep drill. Quarterbacks kind of buy into it because they say, this is, this is quarterback, this is a quarterback throw. This is like a linebacker hitting the bag, you know, as he, as he shuffles down the line of scrimmage during an agility period. So this is, this is a, been a drill. You say, oh man, Terry, you have Trent Green do this? Dante Culpepper? You had all those guys do this? <coughs> yeah, darn right. And they bought into it. And they buy into it because they can see themselves getting better. It's a 10 second drill. And we time them, not every day, but we practice it every day. Every practice, they would start this drill right after the quarterback center change. And they would go through a couple of different reps. And it's a 10 second drill where they go as fast as they can over the bag for 10 seconds. Now, we have a ball down? <coughs> yes, we do. And I thought I saw a football down here. Anyway, so now they have the ball. And the ball sits right here as if they're, they're passing the football in this, in this style, where they're cradling the ball right above the numbers high on the jersey. So as they're, as they're going over the bag, that ball is, is cradled right through here. And the third thing you want to coach is don't allow them to put their eyes down to the ground. When they get good at this, pretty soon their eyes are up and they're going over that bag and they're just going as fast as they can. Their feet are hitting, their feet are quiet. They've got good ball security. I'll come up sometimes and try to, try to uh, slap the ball out of their hands to make sure they've got you know, finger pressure on that ball as they're dropping back. And that's, that's just another phase of this drill. This drill started, uh, oh boy, when I was at Stanford, I, I, I know it was before that, but we had, a neat, we had a neat quarterback school one year. It was kind of a who's who. And to this day, the one player that, that performed this particular drill still holds a record in my mind. It's a 10 second drill, and you count every time their feet hit one side of the bag. So if they end up on the original side of the bag at the end of 10 seconds, that should be an even count. If they end up on the other side of the bag when the 10 second mark hits, that should be an odd count. Well, we had Manning, uh, Greasy, um, uh, Brady. These were all the guys we had at this camp at the Stanford quarterback school at one time. And along came this little scrawny kid from Idaho, and uh, Jake Plummer. And uh, wow, could, I mean, he had, back in those days, he had the magic feet. And he did 30 in a 10 second period of time, 30. I've never seen a quarterback do 30 cents, but it's something uh, I was asked, um, the quarterbacks can start out, and maybe the first time a young quarterback does 12. But by week three, he does 14. By week 18, he does 17. And pretty soon at the end of the season, He's improved five or six steps. Oh, that's huge, guys. When your quarterback senses that he's getting better at something, you've got the right formula for success. So that's the quarterback quick step. So I wish uh, I could show it to you. I, I show you some some uh, NFL guys going through that, but I don't have uh, the, that tape to show you right now. Pat and go. Pat and go. One thing I want to uh, share with you that I've, I've learned just recently. At the Dolphins, we were really concerned about our guys dropping too many passes at the beginning of the year. And I wish I could say that we corrected it all. Well, we did. But we did get better. And what we in, in filtered into the typical pat and go, you know when you put your guys running down whatever landmarks you want to use, and they're about 40 yards apart, and the quarterback packs the ball, and he, and he throws the football at an angle where the receiver catches the ball at its highest point. Fun. The one thing you want to coach your quarterback on, by the way, is make him do different things when you throw him the pat and go. Put him on his back foot and hold it, and then throw. All right? Take, tell him to back out and throw. Tell him to, to take a little crossover and throw. Tell him to take a little crossover and a half and hold it and throw. Crossover and drive it one time. Do a little different things with your quarterbacks. Don't let them become robots out there and go through this. You know, they're at the beach playing catch with their buttercup. Okay? Let them, let them understand how important their, their feet are. Now, here's what we, we, we got going this past year. Strong policy. Terry, what is that? Now, all of a sudden, after a minute of pat and go, and, and uh, once we riverside it, that's another minute. And then at the third minute mark, it's a three-minute drill. 
Now we say, okay, strong to the ball. Quarterbacks moved up to 20 yards from each other. You have quarterbacks at both ends, I would think, in your hat and go drill. They move up to 20. Now, the receiver, once the quarterback puts his, puts his hands to the ball and raises it to be thrown, then the receiver starts to run directly at that quarterback at full tilt. And the quarterback throws the ball right at his neckline to where he has to approach the football and catch it strong to the ball with his hands. And that was as good a drill as we probably had for our receivers throughout the course of the year. And that was a minute drill. And then they'd, they'd come right at the quarterback, catch the ball, flip it to whomever, and then get in the other line and go at the other quarterback. A neat drill, guys, if you're really trying to coach your receivers to be strong to the ball with their hands and to make the catch out in front of their jersey. And that was, that was what we did to conclude the pat and go drill. And I thought it was really good. This is a three-minute drill. So let's go back. You've been in a meeting as a quarterback for 25 minutes. You're out on the field. You go through a quarterback center exchange drill. That's a four-minute period. Four minutes. Bang! you got to get into it. you got to get going. All right? And what do quarterbacks and centers like to do? They like to stand around and talk about what happened on Thursday night. You know? And pretty soon the clock is ticking. So you get your guys under the impression that we've got to get things done as soon as, as we hit the field. The quick step drill is a, an agility period. It's a three minute period. You don't spend the entire time going through a quarterback quick step. After they do that, they bounce out of there, now they go to the drops. I'll tell you a quick story about uh, Coach Wallace and Joe Montana. Uh, Montana came over one day, we were at Stanford, and, and I grabbed him and I said, what was it like, you know? when you first started with Coach Walls back at the 49ers, and he said, it was the darndest thing I've ever been through. He would take me out, and we would go out for three days straight and do nothing but drop back. And he said, and never once did I touch a football. He says, for three days, that's all Coach Walls did with me, was drop me back and, and teach me the mechanics of footwork without a football. And he said, I almost wanted to quit. And I said, this is the NFL? But that's, that's how important, guys, footwork is to a quarterback. And you can, you can sit here and say, well, Coach Terry, we're in the gun. Baloney, you coach fundamentals from the gun if that's what it means, all right? And whatever those fundamentals are, I don't, I don't you know, you can probably, when, when Coach Davis talks about some of his quarterback background, he, he's had some great success with the shotgun. You might want to ask him that question. What do you really coach from the gun? Okay, what makes it successful, what doesn't. But here we go, Pat and Joe, strong to the ball. That's a three minute drill. So that's four, uh, three, and three. You have now been on the field for 10 minutes. Quarterback, you've been on the field for 10 minutes and you've mastered some of the most important fundamentals of the game. Swipe drill. I wish I had that football. Does anybody have a football? Darn it, it was right here. And, well, okay, the swipe drill. We all talk about quarterback, ball, ball security, protect the ball when you're in the pocket. Anytime you start to move, make sure you have two hands on the ball. Two, two things you can coach. The swipe drill is where the quarterback gets back to his prescribed depth, and now he has to move. He's got an unblocked defender coming at him, and the swipe comes from, if I can hold the football in an imaginary football like this, the swipe, boom, comes from the back elbow, and it goes to the front side of the, of, of the body. And he swipes the ball through as he hitches up into the pocket or as he moves into the pocket, he's swiping that back elbow. And both hands are on the ball. And believe me, guys, I'll tell you what, it takes a monster defensive rusher to knock the ball out of your quarterback's hands with that kind of a drill. The other, the other uh, fundamental to that is high and tight quarterbacks, as you, as you move in the pocket, Bring the ball into your jersey and move. And don't let the ball dangle out here whether you have two hands on it or not. Our young rookie quarterback this year, John Beck, had a great run in college at BYU. He's standing back there, got two hands on the ball, and I'm saying, man, he's, he's got great fundamentals this, this game. And the guy from, uh, I want to say, maybe it was New England. It was New England rusher, and boom, just knocks that ball right out of his hand. I mean, that's, that's, that's how easy it is for a, for a young quarterback to lose the football. And my, in my thought, that's worse than a pass interception. When your quarterback drops the ball on the ground because he's 
been chased or he, he's dangling with the ball. Man, that's a turnover that, uh, oh, thanks, Coach. It's not exactly uh, what you expected. World Football League special. <laughs> this is way too. I don't know how you handle it. But, but here's the swipe drill. So you, so you, so you drop them back to five, yard, uh, five steps or seven steps, three steps, whatever. Thank you. Whatever you have. And as he catches up, and you're the, pet, you're the rusher now. You're the coach. And you're rushing right at that quarterback. And, it, and as he, boom, moves that back elbow, and that ball swipes to the front side, that's because I, as the coach or as the pass rusher, have come at him and tried to swipe the ball out of his hand. And that's, that's where the term gets its name. Okay, or the drill gets its name. So that's it. Or you, you, you say high and tight and bring it right into your jersey as you move. Don't let your quarterback be soft-handed with the, with the uh, guide hand and make sure he strengthens his you talk about weightlifting and all the great things that go on in, in your weightlifting classes. Teach your quarterbacks to strengthen their wrists and their hands and their forearms, and I'll guarantee you that'll be your, your quarterback will be ahead of the game with that in mind. Okay? Um, quick release drill. We'll pass on that. Okay, guys, I'm running out of time. I don't want to. You want to just have to cram things at you. Uh, spot drill, <coughs> uh, stance arrow. Akron passing, stance arrow. Uh, okay, maybe I can do this. Stance arrow. If you were to throw the football at that at that receiver right there, you would lead with your with your lead foot, and you would deliver the football in such a way that that lead foot would take you right at that receiver. And that's where the stance arrow idea germinated from or, or got its origin, in my opinion, is all of a sudden now, whoo, I'm shooting a bow and arrow, and my stance is pretty much like a quarterback stance. Now, not often is that back foot, you know, uh, flat to the line of scrimmage like this, but at least the left foot is always pointed toward the projected part of the catch. If I'm throwing a crossing route, and my quarterback's throwing on the back hip all the time, that's because my stance arrow is delivering the football as to where I see him rather than to where he's going to catch the ball. So the stance arrow has to open. You say, Coach, that's easy. Shoot, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. Unless you're in the pocket and you're working yourself around. People oftentimes ask me, what was one of the best traits of Trent Green? And he was, a, he was kind of an unheralded quarterback in the NFL. You know, when you, when you compare him to Manning and all those crazy stats. But what Trent Green brought to the position, he played it like a quarterback. And when he played it, he played it with an exceptional ability to move the stance arrow foot at the last instant so that he could deliver an accurate pass. And the more your stance arrow is in alignment, the more chance your quarterback has of being accurate. I went here at the Bears, I had a nice young quarterback named Grossman. And wow, was he talented with his arm. He could throw the ball, boom, like this. And I'd say, Rex, come on now, get, get a line. And every once in a while, I'd have to hold my thought because that ball would just zoom into the strike point. Your quarterback may pull that off once in a while. But more than likely, it'll be an inaccurate throw percentage-wise. So teach him to properly work his feet. And obviously, the stand zero is part of that. Uh, practice running. How many times do you watch your quarterback run with the football and he fumbles it up the field? Or he fumbles it because he gets hit by the sideline. Practice your quarterback running with the football and protecting the ball. And you say, well, how do you do that? Coach, well, yeah, I'll have seven on seven, right? And every once in a while, he doesn't have a, a throw to go to or one on one, and the guy falls down, encourage him to run with the ball, burst with it, and practice ball protection, uh, practice scoring. Wow, is that something that we tend to overlook, especially with young minds. Practice scoring, set up drills, practice your F, your seven on seven in the red zone at least once a week so that you get the feeling of your guys scoring and they get the feeling of scoring. Anything you do, practice scoring and it'll start to become a culture in terms of your offensive uh, style of play. Um, I'm sorry guys, I'm going so fast on this. Uh, here, here is what a great uh, uh, quarterback grade thing looks like 
And I'll just show you something that, that probably puts a signature to my comment. And that is, Cleo Lemon had 36 total plays in this game. He had 30 pluses, he had six minuses, no turnovers for 84% grade. 84% grade. That's the highest grade any quarterback got throughout the season at the Dolphins this year, 84%. And this game was played against the Bengals, and we did not win this game. That's why I don't like percentage grades. I think percentage grades can mislead you totally. Uh, if it relates to your offensive lineman, more so maybe, maybe it's better for offensive linemen. But for a quarterback, I would not get hung And the only reason I put percentage grades here is because the personnel department dictated it. It'd be like your principal saying, Coach, I need to see your grade. All right? Just say, good. I'll give them to you, but there will be no percentage on it. This is John Beck. He had 33 plays. He had uh, 20, uh, uh, what is it, 28 and, and 5, and he had one fumble for 84%. And again, that was the highest grade given out to a quarterback percentage-wise. Most of the time, the, these grades for these quarterbacks were in the 70s. And, and you say, well, coach, is that good enough to win? I don't know. We obviously didn't win enough, but 70% doesn't really reflect what a quarterback should be all about. But some of these summaries are right. The written comments are important. This is the this is the final conclusion to a to a great sheet. I just wanted to throw that by you. Um, always make sure for your own for your own recall is to make sure you track interceptions. Okay, make sure you track interceptions. You get going through a game a season and you can be in a how many games does your team play in a season? Ten. How many does your team play? Ten. How about you, coach? Ten. Pretty soon, game seven. And you've kind of forgotten about some of the interceptions that occurred early in the season. Always keep a running log on interceptions. This is what it looks like. And not only do you put interceptions down, you put the, you put the time of the game, the score, the hash mark. See if there's a common theme that's starting to develop with your quarterback. Whoa! He's always throwing the doggone interception when he throws to his left. That might be something worthwhile to, to recognize. Okay, so that's, that's what interceptions look like. And then, of course, then you have the other part of the interception chart, which you love, you know, when it says no interceptions. And make sure your quarterback sees the good and the bad. Share this chart with your quarterback, not with your principal, and not with the uh, head of the booster club, and not with your wife. Share it with your quarterback only, and that will build up that, that, that element of trust. Um, How do you handle your quarterback when he comes off the field? All right, he just has thrown a, uh, an interception. Teach him leadership at that point, and you don't have to do it right at that spot. You can do it during practice. If he comes off the practice field or the playing field and gives you that body language where he has lost confidence in his ability to make a play, you address that. I've always maintained how a quarterback comes off the field after an adversity type of play that you find out most about his leadership. And you address that. And you address that from the, from the moment you get that young quarterback and you start to mold his leadership. There's, a, there's two elements of quarterback play that I'm, I'm really sold on. Fundamentals or, or technique or skill development. I had Todd Collins for uh, three years at the Kansas City Chiefs. He's the young man that almost took the uh, Redskins into the playoffs and beyond. <laughs> and Todd was the backup to Trent Green. And he would sit in my meetings, and he was about as fundamentally sound as I've ever been around a quarterback. And he would always recite things to me. And he would always talk about, Coach, remember, uh, transition in practice is a learned practice skill. Uh, ball protection is different than ball security. I mean, so guys, whatever you can give your quarterbacks, they will start to latch on to and, and feel real good about the development. Let me share one thing with you. Uh, we were at the Dolphins. This is kind of a spontaneous visit. Michael Jordan showed up. He was there playing golf. So he came down. And all of a sudden, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so we crowded into the meeting room, and, and Michael came down and just off the top of his head spoke to the team for a couple of minutes. And then he, he went on his way. First time I'd ever been around uh, Michael Jordan. And the only thing he would talk about, the only thing he would talk about was how important Fundamentals played 
in his development as a, as, as a player, even when he was at the NBA level. And he said, as soon as you stop paying attention to fundamentals, they start to disappear. And he was really, really sold on that was the one thing that he brought to that Chicago Bulls team besides leadership. And we asked him about leadership. And he said, you know, the only time I felt like I needed to lead my team was in practice. And that was the only time that I really felt like my leadership was needed with that championship run that we had with the Bulls. Not during games, but in practice. So if you have a strong leader, you encourage him to show what he's about in your practice environment as well as any other place. Okay? I want to close by, uh, by just saluting you guys. Um, there, was, there was a phrase that every teacher's charge in education should be to make sure that his or her student got an A. Wouldn't that be great in education if some of our teachers who check in at 7.30 and leave at 3.30, wouldn't that be great if they had the same responsibility that you have as coaches? Where if you were to say to yourself, if I could coach every one of my players to play at an A level, we'd have a great chance to win. How many teachers would probably present that same phrase? And I want to take you back in my, in, my, in, in my role as a father. And this is where I want to salute each and every one of you. I had a young guy named Garrett and he ended up playing for me at Red Dirksen. But, and he started out at Ohio State on scholarship, transferred to Red Dirksen. Dumb guy, huh? dumb, but no. He just, he just had a reason to do that because I was there. But anyway, he's playing as a young freshman in high school. Plays. Freshman football does very well. Plays freshman basketball. I said, here, what are you doing up with basketball? He says, oh, I, I, my friends are playing and in this, you know, this is a Catholic Jesuit school, so competition is all boys, and it's it's one of those things. It's built in, it's culture. Well, he goes ahead and plays, and he's the twelfth man on the on the squad. He's not playing. And so he comes to me and says, Dad, I'm gonna quit. And I said, No, you aren't. Do you remember when you made the decision to make this team, first of all, you had to compete to even make the team. Now you're on that team and you're going to be the best 12th man or 11th man that this team could possibly have. So he comes back two weeks later and said, Dad, I'm going to quit. I can't do it anymore. I said, here, you got to go out and every day find something in your game that you can, that you can fundamentally get better at. And you ask your coach, ask your coach if he sees that development. He says, Dad, my coach hasn't talked to me in four and a half weeks. He has not even used my name, much less look at me with any eye-to-eye -eye contact. And, and there's just nothing. There's nothing there for me to look forward to. So you can see how powerful you guys are in this room, dealing with young minds. And of course, I, I, I counsel young Garrett to stay with it and go throughout the season and, and, and finish, which he did. That coach, bless his heart, was not a good one in that particular scenario. You have any player you coach, guys, and you coach them hard, and you coach them with the same intensity that you coach those starters with. Now, you're going to like those starters a little bit more, aren't you? Because they can make plays. But you make sure that that 12th man is just as important as that first man. And that's what I salute all of you about, because what you do with the young guys of this, of this uh, world in terms of a sport that's very tough. Football is a tough game. You know, I've learned, I've learned the last couple of years how tough it really can be. But you guys keep doing what you're doing. Keep supporting those young guys and keep coaching them. Keep coaching them as if they were your son. Thanks a lot.